Hello everyone, this is Paleo Nerd back with another Jurassic Fight Club analysis. In this video, I will cover the fifth episode in the series, Deep Sea Killers, to determine what is accurate and inaccurate about it. This is the first of two episodes in this series to take place in the Cenozoic era rather than the Mesozoic, as it takes place in Miocene, Japan, about 15 million years ago. In layman's terms, this episode takes place after the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. Now, obviously, it's been established before that this show, called Jurassic Fight Club, has several episodes that take place in the Cretaceous period, aka not the Jurassic, so this really shouldn't be a surprise. Regardless, this at mean, least means that this episode will be slightly more accurate slightly. We'll start off with the combatant that you've actually heard of, and probably the main reason most people watch this episode, Carcharocles Megalodon, or as most people call it, Megalodon. Probably the most famous prehistoric fish of all time. This shark is usually known only from its teeth and partial vertebrae, although a possible skeleton has been discovered. But it has managed to gain a reputation as the most powerful predator to ever swim the oceans. It lived from the early Miocene to near the end of the Pliocene, about 23 to 2.6 million years ago, making it one of the longest lasting species in Earth's history. Although it is difficult to estimate, most scientists agree that Megalodon likely reached a length of 10.5 to 14 meters or 34 to 37 feet long for males and 13 to 17 meters or 44 to 56 feet long for females and may have weighed between 12 to 40 tons for males and 30 to 60 tons for females. While some estimates have placed this animal as much smaller or much larger, it's safe to say that Megalodon was likely one of, if not the, largest fish to ever swim Earth's oceans. Based on its size, Megalodon was probably an apex predator, eating whatever it could bite into, from primitive whales to fellow sharks to seals to even any land animal unfortunate enough to get washed out to sea. Megalodon teeth have been discovered all over the world, indicating that like modern great sh white sharks, Megalodon may have traveled great distances in search of prey, literally swimming between continents to find food. Its bite force has been estimated at around 12.5 to 20 tons of force, much stronger than that of T-Rex, meaning it could pretty much kill whatever it wanted with one or two bites. While originally considered closely related to the great white shark, Megalodon is now placed in the extinct shark family Otodon today. The genus it is placed in is also a subject of much debate, as it was originally placed in the genus Carcharodon along with the great white, and as an Otodontid, it has been placed in the genuses Carcharocles, Otodus, Megasolactus and Procarcharodon. Now, the Jurassic Flight Club version basically depicts Megalodon as a giant great white and even places it in the genus Carcharodon, which, as we've established, is no longer considered accurate. It's possible that idea wasn't proved yet when the episode was produced, so I'll give it some slack there. The thing I can't excuse is the design. It is, it is literally just a giant great white shark. The problem is that's just not how anatomy works. When animals grow larger, their proportions shift to compensate. Such a thin build for a megalodon probably would have made the animal completely unable to move on its own. When trying to imagine how Megalodon may have looked in life, you need to compare it to sharks of similar size, in this case the whale shark and basking shark. When using these as reference, it becomes likely that the Megalodon had a larger tail than is commonly depicted, 
so that it could move faster while requiring less movement to do so. Megalodon was also likely much more stocky and robust in build than Great Whites to help support its large weight. Finally, the fins and snout would be more rounded and less pointy than the show's depiction in order to reduce drag and make it easier to swim. Yes, real Megalodon had curves. Regardless, Megalodon definitely looked way different from how this show depicts it, but that's not all. Although the show gives Megalodon a reasonable size of 50 feet or over 15 meters long, they also describe it as being as long as a jumbo jet, which is over 220 feet or almost 70 meters long. Way bigger than a Megalodon. The show also gives the impression that Megalodon had to constantly eat in order to survive. His bulk so massive, the search for food never ends. However, due to its metabolism and the large prey it commonly ate, Megalodon probably only had to eat occasionally, similar to modern sharks like the Great White. The show also claims that Megalodon first appeared 50 million years ago, which would be around the early Eocene Epoch. However, Megalodon is only known to have lived from the early Miocene to the late Pliocene, although Otodus obliquus, a possible ancestor to Megalodon, did live during that time. Also, later during the fight, the Megalodon's denticles Small tooth-like projections on its skin are strangely described as taste buds. The Megalodon's skin was covered with tiny taste buds called denticles. Even though they were in no way used for tasting, but rather to help reduce drag and help it swim more efficiently. Finally, it is stated that Megalodon was likely an antisocial animal like the Great White Shark when not even great white sharks are antisocial and in fact have their own social hierarchy. Megalodon itself likely was solitary, but using the great white shark as a comparison proves that the series knows absolutely nothing about sharks beyond the idea that sharks are soulless eating machines. Now let's move on to Meg's opponent, the biting sperm whale Brigma Fisetter. So what is Brigma Fisetter? Brigma Fisetter shigensis, or biting sperm whale of Shiga, or sometimes just the biting sperm whale, is named for the large teeth on, the, on both the upper and lower jaw, whereas modern sperm whales only have teeth on the bottom jaw. Brigma Fisetter is part of an entire group of what are called macro-raptorial sperm whales, sometimes simply called raptorial sperm whales. This is a group of sperm whales that lived during the Miocene, about 15 to 9 million years ago, and are defined by large enamel-covered teeth on the top and bottom jaws, indicating that they likely filled apex predator niches similar to modern-day orcas. The group currently consists of four genuses, Brigma Fisetter, Acro Fisetter, Zygophysetter, and the largest and last of the group, Leviathan. But back to Brigma Fisetter. It is the earliest of the raptorial sperm whales, living from 15 to 14 million years ago, during the Langean age of the Miocene Epoch. It is known from a single, nearly complete skeleton discovered in the Beso Formation in the Nagano Prefecture in Japan, where it likely lived near the top of the food chain, preying on early dolphins and baleen whales. It reached a length of 7 meters or 23 feet long and weighed around 6 to 8 tons, about the size of an orca. Like its modern relative, the sperm whale, Brigma Fisetter possessed a spermacetti organ, which helped the animal produce biosonar, which, like other whales, was likely used to help locate both prey and possible predators. Now, the Jurassic Fight Club version actually isn't half bad, since, as you might guess, it's pretty hard to screw up the design for a whale. It looks like how the real animal might have looked when it was alive, 
and even the coloring matches a whale that likely lived a lot like orcas. There are a few problems though. First, the animal is way too big. In this show, Brigma Fiesetter is said to be 40 feet or almost 13 meters long, about twice as long as the real animal. Such a large size more closely fits that of Brigma Fiesetter's larger cousin, Leviathan, which is estimated at a length of 13.5 to 17.5 meters or 44 to 57 feet long. However, Leviathan lived much later than the episode is set, around 10 to 9 million years ago in the Tortonian age of the Miocene, and the only confirmed fossil of the animal was found in Peru, not Japan, so we'll just stick with Brigma Fisetter for now. Next, the show claims that Brigma Fisetter was capable of using its biosonar as a weapon to stun prey. The whales normally use their sonar to find prey in the darkest parts of the ocean. But like modern killer whales and dolphins, they also use that sonar as a weapon. They narrow the beam and they can actually stun and in some cases kill smaller prey. This seems based on a theory about how modern sperm whales catch their prey, often called the acoustic prey debilitation hypothesis which proposes that sperm whales use ultrasonic waves to disorient their prey or even cause bodily injury. However, studies attempting to prove this hypothesis have frequently fallen short, meaning that this is likely not the case. So if modern sperm whales can't use sound to stun prey, chances are that a prehistoric relative that lived over 10 million years prior couldn't either. Finally, the show claims that Brigma Fisetter pods are led by a bull male. Instantly, the pack's leader, the bull whale. However, based on modern whales, that likely is likely not the case. Modern sperm whale groups are rather similar to elephant herds, as adult males are typically solitary except when mating, while adult females and juveniles live in pods. Males will also occasionally form loose bachelor groups with other males, but they are prim primarily solitary. While it is possible that Brigma Fisetter had similar group behavior, orcas are another possible base for the group behavior of the biting sperm whale. Orcas are actually quite similar to sperm whales in terms of how their pods are structured as once again, pods are led by adult females. However, unlike sperm whale groups, males don't leave their pods except for very brief periods to mate. In fact, orcas typically stay within their mother's pod for their entire life, unlike any other known mammal. These groups are called matrilines and consist of the elderly female or matriarch and all of her descendants. Given how Brigma Fisetter occupied a similar niche to orcas, it is definitely possible that they also had a similar group structure, perhaps somewhat of a blend of sperm whale and orca groups. That's really it for the combatants, so let's see how the fight plays out. The fight starts with a lone megalodon hunting for prey. Very quickly, it Attacks a lone Brigma Fisetter who has been separated from its pod. The shark takes the whale by surprise, attacking it from below like a great white. In rapid succession, the mag bites off both the whale's pectoral fins and a large portion of its tail. However, most paleontologists believe that Megalodon primarily targeted the chest cap cavity of its prey rather than the tail meaning the Brigma Fisetter would be killed instantly and the fight would just end there. Anyway, the Brigma Fisetter is completely unable to escape and the Meg waits for its prey to bleed to death instead of, you know, just eating it like modern sharks do. Now, that might seem like a short fight, but it's not quite over yet. As it starts to bleed to death, the injured whale sends out a distress call and its pod happens to be close enough to hear the call and they arrive on the scene. The mag is taken by surprise as the pod begins an all-out assault on her comrade's attacker, biting the shark and ramming it with their massive heads. 
This, ca this causes the Meg to retreat to the depths, but the whales continue to attack it, stunning it with their sonar and continuing to ram the shark. The only problem is that the Megalodon should be dead from that attack. I mean, it literally gets hit in the midsection multiple times with the force of a freight train. That much trauma would kill a whale, let alone a giant shark. Even with a flexible cartilage skeleton, the shark's internal organs would be severely ruptured from such an attack, causing it to bleed to death from the inside. That is, if it didn't die from the sheer force of the blow first. So, yeah, that shark should be dead. Anyway, the Megalodon miraculously manages to avoid getting torn to pieces, and the pod turns to their injured family member. In a desperate attempt to help it recover, the pod try to lift the injured Brigma Phi Setter to the surface for air. Unfortunately, its wounds are too severe and the injured whale sinks into the ocean depths as the Megalodon returns to his meal and feasts. That's the end of the fight, but there is one more major inaccuracy right as the credits roll, as the narrator, along with science fiction author Steve Alton, addresses the possibility that Megalodon still exists in our oceans. Using the cliche and overused much of the ocean is still unexplored excuse to justify their claims. Of course, some other experts are there to say it is unlikely, but it is clear by the time the credits start to roll that the show is taking the Megalodon as still alive side. I'll probably explain this more in depth in a future video, but the idea that Megalodon still exists in our oceans is not legitimately taken seriously by most real scientists. As, mo as no Megalodon fossils have been found that date any later than 2.6 million years ago. Not only that, but Megalodon lived almost exclusively in coastal waters and was not adapted to live in the deep waters that would be necessary for it to stay hidden for almost 3 million years. So basically, if Megalodon was still alive, we would have seen it by now, and transportation by sea would probably be near impossible. Even though some doubt is expressed in the episode, the fact that they even mention that asinine fringe theory and attempt to present it as fact is enough to count that as a major inaccuracy. Besides that, this fight wasn't that bad. It was surprisingly pretty simple and much shorter than the other fights at only 10 minutes long. With the exception of the Megalodon surviving an assault from four giant sperm whales, the fight is actually pretty accurate, although far from perfect. Once again, no other inaccuracies really need to be discussed, so we'll just move on to what really happened. Now, this episode is slightly different from the others, as it really isn't based on a particular fossil discovery. While there have been numerous whale fossils with bite marks from Megalodon found all over the world, Brigma Fisetter is not one of those whales, as it is only known from one partial skeleton with no sign of Megalodon bite marks. So, why was this an episode? Well, they clearly wanted an episode with Megalodon and needed a decent opponent. That, of course, is a bit of a problem when not many animals reached Megalodon's size at the time, since even the whales it preyed on were pretty small compared to today's whales. Sure, they could have faced it up against Cacaracles chubitensis, a close relative of Megalodon that was slightly smaller and lived from 28 to 5 million years ago, but I guess they didn't think two very similar sharks fighting each other would be entertaining. There's also Ramphasuchus, an extinct relative of the false gharial, which lived in India during the Miocene and could reach an estimated length of 8 to 11 meters or 26 to 36 feet long, as well as fellow Gavialid Pisogavialis, which lived in southern Peru from 7 to 5 million years ago and could reach a length of 10 meters or 32 feet long. However, these two likely had a primarily fish-oriented diet and probably weren't a match for Megalodon. 
That pretty much leaves the raptorial sperm whales, and at the time the episode was being produced, only two had been discovered and classified, Bergmophy setter and Zygophy setter. So they just upped the size of Bergmophy setter and called it a day. Now, since there was no actual discovery to base this fight off of, how did a confrontation between Megalodon and Brigmafia Sutter really play out? Well, for the first and probably only time, the show is pretty much spot on. On its own, a Brigmafia Sutter would not stand a chance against a fully grown Megalodon, but a whole pot of them have a decent chance of killing a Meg. Before we conclude this video, I want to briefly resurrect how to make it better by suggesting an alternative to this fight. If I could remake this episode, I would definitely change the setting to Tortonian Peru and pin Megalodon up against Leviathan, which would definitely be a much closer fight, and unlike other episodes, the fight would absolutely end in death for, uh, for one of the combatants. That wraps up this analysis, and I have to say that this episode is incredibly accurate compared to the others. In fact, I believe I would be telling the truth if I said that this is the most accurate episode in the entire series, and probably the only one that doesn't make me cringe too hard when watching it. With that in mind, it probably wins the title of the best episode in the series, Purely by being the one I can tolerate the most. The fight is actually quite tame, as there is only one death in the entire episode, and the way that the injured Brigma Fisetter cries out for help, and the pod's vain attempts to save their compa companion, actually make me feel sorry for the whale, something that can't really be said for the rest of the series. That being said, it does have its flaws, although there's really no inaccuracy in this episode that you wouldn't find in a Walking With episode, with the exception of the Megalodon Still Lives Today bullshit. Unfortunately, this will probably be the last time I say that many good things about this series. That's all for today, I hope you enjoyed this analysis and that you learned something new today. My next video will be all about the cryptozoological side of Megalodon and explaining why it is definitely extinct and not still swimming in Earth's oceans. And after that I will analyze the sixth episode of Jurassic Fight Club, Hunter Becomes Hunted, which will see the return of Allosaurus and Jurassic Fight Club's favorite whipping boy, Ceratosaurus. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.